we go. Hello, everybody. My, I would like to welcome you and thank you for taking the time out of your very busy lives and schedules to attend this webinar. Um, so I'm Ashley Colmer. I'm a nurse practitioner from Charleston, West Virginia. I know a lot of you. I um, look forward to meeting a lot of you. And today's webinar is, is just to you know, help us establish patient expectations in order to optimize our patient outcomes. So I will, in just a moment, I'll take that time to let everybody on the faculty to introduce themselves. But we really wanna keep this very, you know, very informative, casual as far as real world life and expectation. So if anybody has any questions, if you have any input, feel free to open or utilize the chat window. Um, I also believe there might be a way to raise your hand through here. Uh, you're not on video or anything, so you can feel free to type and we'll monitor that chat window and hopefully, you know, answer any questions that you may have. With that, I will let Marie introduce herself. Hello, everyone. Like Ashley said, thank you for taking time out of your busy day to come and listen to us, give you some pearls and other little tidbits that we can help you um, get the best outcome for your patients with mild. I'm Marie Zambelli. I'm a nurse practitioner in Venice, Florida. I've been doing this for a little over three years. Um, and I'm gonna let Kelsey introduce herself. Hello, everybody. My name is Kelsey Kimball. I'm a physician assistant and I work at the Orthopedic Institute in Gainesville, Florida. And I think Lauren is up next. And I'm Lauren. Um, I'm a nurse practitioner in Wichita, Kansas, and I um, have been working in pain management for about four and a half years. Patrick. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks uh, for joining us uh, on this Wednesday evening or afternoon, I should say. Uh, my name is Patrick McGinn. I'm a physician assistant in Shrewsbury, New Jersey. I work uh, for a practice called Premier Pain Centers, and I've been working in interventional pain for almost about seven years. Uh, and then I'll hand it off to Kristen. Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm Kristen Klein. I'm a nurse practitioner out of Long Island, New York. I work at the Pain Institute of Long Island, and I've been in pain management for about four years. So I'm going to kick it back off to Ashley. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. I should say I've been a nurse practitioner um, at the Spine and Nerve Center of the Virginias in West Virginia, in case nobody can tell that, for almost, well, about eight years now. I work with Dr. Deer and Dr. Kim. I do have a different perspective in regards to we have, um, I go in the OR and I see patients in the office. So I kind of see all sides of it, which is helpful. Um, so tonight's agenda, you know, we're going to, we're going to go through, where do you identify patients? What do you say? How do you in introduce this therapy? What is success? How do you view it? How does your patient view it? How do you set that up? What are your different follow-up visits? Every one of us is going to have a little bit different expectation or set a little different expectation and different follow-up. Then when do you re or introduce reconditioning? And then we all know, no matter what the therapy is, there's always going to be patients that just it we ju it just doesn't help. So, um, and then some of the other you know common patient questions or misunderstandings. So we hope to address all this and hopefully keep it very interactive with everyone. And with that, I'll hand it over to Marie. Okay, everyone, I hope that you've all received the new um, brochures and tools that MILD has put out recently uh, and have them all in your offices. If you haven't, please contact your rep and make sure that you get a hold of those new brochures. They're very, very nice. And I really like utilizing them when I'm speaking to the patient about MILD or potentially about MILD you know, down the road. They have uh, really clear pictures that give you the opportunity to explain to the patient sort of in real life. And I utilize this along with their MRI that I have pulled up while I'm talking to them and showing them the drawing in the brochure along with their MRI and kind of correlates. And it really helps them get a grasp on what it is we're talking about and what mild could do for them and why their symptoms are the way they are, you know, that they have to lean over and they, 
can't walk or stand typically very long and have to sit and then they'll, they'll feel better while they do that. Also, there's other tools available. You know, there's a video out there. The um, ESI card is really great. It helps kind of get that conversation going about getting uh, mild in your algorithm or in your in your pathway sooner. You know, do an MR, do an epidural and then get them to mild if that's what you think. You know, is the best for the patient. I'll tell you that is my practice. If I see someone new for the first time and I'm identifying their you know problem right away. I'll tell them, you know, yeah, we're going to do an epidural likely, but this is in your future, in the near future. So, and I automatically will show them their MRI. I use these brochures and I'll even sometimes draw on it and pinpoint exactly where their ligamentum flavum hypertrophy is. I give it to them to take home. It's funny, oftentimes they're asking for extra so they can give it to their friends, which is really fun. And, um, Again, going over their MRI, I can't say that enough. You should be really comfortable reading the MRI, identifying the ligament. If you're not sure about that, please reach out to your rep or to us so we can help you get more comfortable with, with um, reading the MRIs and explaining it to the patient. There's also a QR, QR code out there, which for some of these patients are more tech savvy than others. And if they're not sure, it's kind of a fun thing to teach them how to do. And it gives them more uh, access to the brochure that way instead of having the actual paper. Some of them really get into learning the new technology. For my patient population, they tend to be older. This page, I, this is kind of the bread and butter, I think right here, you know, this, this picture really speaks to what's going on and it gives them a really clear picture and a way to um, explain to them what their condition is. And again, I'll have the MRI pulled up and I'll show them, you know, this is, this is it in the drawing. And then this is what it actually looks like on your MRI. And it really kind of opens their eyes and gives them a better understanding of why they're experiencing the symptoms that they are. They really, really like it. And then I also, like I said before, we'll get into explaining that we're going to get them too mild rather quickly because we want to get them that longer lasting relief and that the epidural is likely going to be a temporary relief um, to get them kind of give the doctor a chance to know their spine and or get maybe if it's a scheduling problem, if you know, for whatever reason, it might not be for a few months, you might want to get them that epidural just to get them some relief. But I'll use this. Um, brochure again to kind of explain that pathway to them and get, you know, and show them different things about what are options for lumbar spinal stenosis and, and show them that mild is very minimally invasive and that we want to implement this as soon as possible and, you know, keep them from a, some of those other more invasive surgeries and procedures. Usually they're all on board for it. Um, this this picture is great too, because it is another avenue to show them what's actually happening in their spine so that they more understand why they're getting the symptoms that they're getting. So you can see here how the ligament is encroaching into the epidural space and while it's irritating the nerves and then causing them all these symptoms with, you know, walking, standing, have to bend over. Just, just more kind of tools in the toolbox to explain to them why this is a good procedure and what they can expect afterwards. This picture again is a, just another drawing of the spaces. Again, I will have their MRI pulled up and I, it shows them you know, sort of a clearer picture in the, your brochure that will show them a pretty drawing of all the levels and how it's gonna look. But then when I pull up the MRI sort of next to this, it really helps them understand what I'm showing them without just them looking at the MRI and them not knowing what they're looking at. So this is a way to get them to get a better understanding of it and explain you know, to them that the mobility is gonna improve along with pain over time and that's one of the things that we're going to focus on is not just their pain, but their mobility. So just to recap quickly, I want to say when I see the patient, 
in for the first time, we'll go over imaging as well as looking at these brochures and explaining, you know, showing them pictures, um, making sure to get a really good deep dive into what their symptoms are and what causes them the most pain. Is it ridiculous or not? Does it feel better when they sit down and worse with walking and standing? Those type of things. I make sure I'm always honing in on what their main pain generator is to be sure this is the right procedure for this patient. Awesome job, Marie. So just to kind of add my input, like I love this picture. I love to draw on here, send this home with the patient. I use a spine model in the picture. I don't always get to have their, I try to have their MRI up, but sometimes it's on a disc at the nurse's station and it just depends. But I think, in, and I actually even use these brochures for other issues, just to give them the picture to take home mm-hmm. so that they can yeah. have that that information in their hand. And then they go home and they say, look, I have this going on. And they have something to show their family or talk to their family about. Um, and I compare it and I always align a spine model with myself and show them. Um, so I think those are all great, great, you know, pearls of wisdom. And I love hearing everybody's input on how you explain things to your patients because it's always a learning experience no matter what the situation. Great job. Thank you. And I think I'm going to be taking over from Marie. I'll be talking about how we assess outcomes after the mild procedure. Um, So like Marie just went over the patient education brochure. Um, There's other marketing materials, um, just resources available to kind of help you manage these patients. Um, And one of them is the Move More questionnaire. Um, This can be utilized in your practice um, to help determine outcomes um, by establishing a baseline and then also being able to use that as a comparison later on. Um, This, of course, can be done without the questionnaire and just documented directly in the uh, medical record. Um, But the questionnaire is helpful and it can help improve your organization. Um, And it also allows that side-by-side comparison later on. Um, So you can fill it out and then upload it as a document into the medical record and be saved for later um, so that you went to revisit it after the procedure is available to you. Um, But it can be used to establish a baseline. Um, We do this often at their pre-op visit. It's required um, at our ASC um, to have a pre-op visit within one month of the procedure. So that's typically when we would use this resource in our practice. Um, And after mild, it can be done um, at any one particular time point, whatever you feel like is most appropriate, um, six weeks out or three months, um, or you can even do it at multiple time points um, at one month, three months, six months, something like that. Um, And so this is kind of the first slide of the Move More questionnaire. Um, You can use this to document kind of the pre and post mild outcomes. Um, So we always have kind of the pain score as one of the more common measures as far as kind of improvement with the procedure. Um, It's definitely the quickest, easiest way to document their pain response. Um, Just put it on a scale of one to 10, things like that. Um, But the pain score doesn't really give a whole picture as far as how a patient improved. Um, So we know that stenosis can cause pain. Um, But one of the main features of stenosis and kind of based on how we diagnose it is just their limitation is function, their ability to stand and walk for periods of time. Um, So walking for a distance, standing time, those are ways to measure the degree to which a patient is affected by stenosis and also a way to measure their response to treatment. Um, So in general, we want to put emphasis on improvement in mobility um, in addition to or even as a main goal is this procedure. And so Another way we can help the patient kind of determine their improvement is to set specific goals prior to the procedure. Maybe they set a goal of being able to walk through the grocery store without taking a break, or they like to go fishing and they can't stand on the dock long enough to finish catching a couple of fish. Um, So those are good goals to kind of have. Um, It's important to also encourage them to have reasonable goals. You know, if they're 85 years old and generally inactive, they may never be able to run a marathon. Um, But if they can get through a trip around the mall, that might be very helpful for them. And then uh, we also have the back side of the sheet. Um, And so, like I said before, one of the main goals and probably the most important thing is to improve mobility over pain. Um, So the patients likely also have other conditions that are contributing to their pain. Um, And it's really important to reinforce and set proper expectations about the likelihood of this procedure in general, improving their pain in light of any other conditions that they may have that be contributing to the back pain. Um, And so it's really important to function, focus on their functional capacity, um, which is often the more limiting factor. Um, 
And so things that we can use to kind of assess that are things like the change in their position, ability to ambulate, how they can participate in their hobbies or um, just general activities of daily living. Um, and I don't want to focus on it too much because Patrick is going to discuss this later in the presentation as well. Um, but patients often tend to experience some more immediate improvement. Sometimes they'll hit a little bit of a plateau phase and then they can continue to have improvement further out from the procedure with time as well. Um, so some patients don't necessarily get extreme relief within the first couple weeks of the procedure. Um, and that doesn't necessarily determine their response later on. So I typically tell them and recommend them to be patient. Um, I like for my patients to wait a minimum of six weeks before they start to have any sort of opinion on how they're gonna do long-term. But it's definitely not unusual for me to see patients improve at the three month mark or even at the six month mark. And so uh, we also talked about how comorbidities can be present in a patient and contribute to their pain. Um, so oftentimes when I'm going through, like Marie said, with imaging going over their MRIs, I'll tell them that there's multiple causes to their stenosis. The majority of patients won't have just one factor that causes the stenosis. Only 5% have this purely central canal stenosis. Uh, so in addition to ligament and flavum hypertrophy, they may also have facet hypertrophy, disc bulging, maybe a little bit of spondy. Um, these factors all come together to contribute to the degree to stenosis. Um, and so there is a level one randomized control trial that has follow-up through two years. Um, it's the MIDAS Encore study. And this demonstrates that patients can have durable benefit in their symptoms, even with these comorbidities that are present. So in addition to central stenosis, they may have a degree of foraminal stenosis or lateral recess stenosis. They can still have improvement with a very minimal procedure like the mild procedure. Um, and that's one of the reasons too, to consider the mild procedure as a first line option um, in any viable candidate after an epidural fails, rather than maybe a more invasive procedure. I think we have a couple questions here. Um, so our first question, does the presence of comorbidities change my expectation um, or the expectation discussion prior to mild? Um, I'll say in general, I tend to have the same discussion with each patient as far as kind of the timeline of what they can expect with the improvement in their symptoms, um, regardless of whether they have comorbidities. Um, I would say that it can take several weeks to months for them to notice a big change in pain and function. So that if don't have um, a big change, I tell them to be very patient, um, but they also have um, a significant likelihood of experiencing pain from other conditions. Maybe it's the facet hypertrophy, or maybe they have modic changes from um, disc desiccation. Um, so I'm very upfront with them about the possibility that they may have pain after this procedure. Um, so I tell them something like, you have multiple factors that are causing your back pain. We're gonna target the one that's causing the back pain that improves very quickly when you sit down and is what's interfering with your ability to walk, you may still have pain from something like arthritis, but we're gonna target this one condition and we can come back and follow up with any additional pain you have afterwards. Does anyone else have any other strategies that they kind of talk about with the patients? I agree with you, Kelsey. We do the same thing in our practice. If their pain is multifactorial and we take a good history, physical exam, and maybe they're symptomatic of a couple of things like you had said, facet arthropathy, maybe they have facet loading, but the LSS and the claudication is really the overriding most bothersome symptom, we're gonna go with mild first. We'll let them know, hey, you may not be getting 100% pain relief from this procedure, and we set that expectation at the initial follow-up or the consultation. You may get 50%, you may get 75%, but it may not be a complete 100% because you have other factors going on with what's causing your back pain. So what we do is we'll have them undergo the procedure, see how they do over those next couple of months, get them into a good PT program, which as we had mentioned, Patrick's gonna talk about, and then we'll reevaluate how much residual pain they have left. Do they still have facet loading? Um, do they have SI joint symptoms? Do they have anterior column pain, maybe vertebrogenic pain? And then we'll go and treat those if need be, if they still have that pain. So it's really important just to set expectations and, and clear goals from the start. I agree with you, Kristen. I like to talk about their mobili mobility more than their pain as a focus so that they can really see how they've progressed because they tend to focus on their pain going away or not and not so much 
you know, can they stand longer or walk further and that type of thing. And I also like to try to identify some of those other problems on their imaging when I'm first looking at things and putting it in my documentation so that it, you know, and just stating, you know, this isn't their primary pain generator right now, but this is something to consider should they develop these symptoms that go along with these other conditions and then let them know you have all these other things going on or these two things or three things and that will address them as you are symptomatic to them and then go from there and they usually feel very comfortable with that knowing that we have a kind of a comprehensive plan in place that we're going to treat each thing as it comes along because very often you quiet one symptom and then another one pops up so they think it didn't work but if I explain it to that degree in the beginning, they, they kind of get it that, you know, this is going to treat one thing and these other things might treat other things. And it's going to take all these things combined to possibly get them the best pain relief. Yeah. And also you're being upfront, you're being straightforward, you're giving them all the facts at the beginning. So it establishes a better bond, a better communication. They trust you more as a provider, basically, when you're giving them all the details up front and they have a plan in place in their head like okay this could be a couple of months i mean multiple things so that it's just best like we had said just to set the expectations absolutely and then our second question uh how do we help patients differentiate between improvements in pain and mobility um i say personally i like to encourage the patients to focus on their ability to do things like stand for periods of time or walk for periods of time it's definitely not unusual for a patient to tell me that they're definitely better, but they don't feel like they had this big change. But if I ask specifically, how long can you stand now? How long can you walk? They'll tell me, maybe I can stand twice as long or five times as long as I could before. Oh, now I can go to the mailbox and I wasn't able to do that before. Um, so I think personally, like we've said probably a dozen times now, setting the expectation prior to the procedure, the difference between pain and that mobility, the function that we expect them to get is gonna be very helpful. Um, and just redirecting them as far as not just pain. What are you able to do now that you weren't able to do before? So many of my patients talk about their, their pets and they'll, they'll say, no, I, now I can walk my dog. That's really, really important to them is to be able to do those types of things. And they realize they are better when they can perform tasks, simple as that, that they couldn't before without pain or being very uncomfortable or having someone else do it. So that, I kind of try to really attribute it to their everyday lives and the things that they either have to do or like to do. And does it get them back doing those things? I think sometimes too, it's, if it's not the patient, maybe it's, we've said this before, there's you know significant other or a family member who maybe they, the patient themselves, you know, are unable to discern if, you know, there's been a change since the procedure, but, you know, maybe their wife said, oh, you know, now you can, you know, stand longer at the kitchen, you know, washing dishes, or now you're able to cook a little bit longer. So I think it's just, again, you know, emphasizing and, and, and you know, in, in this population, everybody's so focused, you know, pain, 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 is the pain better? And, you know, so I think that, you know, we have to emphasize that, you know, it's, it's they kind of go pain and mobility go hand in hand. So if we hopefully can improve your pain, you know, you're able to sort of increase your mobility and your functionality in turn in the long run, and it'll help, you know, keep your pain hopefully at a minimal level. And then uh, this next question, are there specific patient types that need more expectation setting than others? I think that there's kind of two patients on the opposite side of the spectrum that I tend to spend more time with as far as setting expectations. Um, one of them is I see patients that can be very anxious about the procedure. Um, it's not common, but occasionally I see it, even though we've talked about it's not really any more invasive than that epidural you just had. Um, I feel like I do need to set their expectations about how minimal that procedure is, but also putting the kind of focus on that functional improvement. We're doing this so you can stand for longer, walk for longer, or so that you can go grocery shopping like you want to. Um, and then the other patient that I see is kind of the complete opposite. They think this is gonna be this magic cure. We're gonna do it. They're not gonna have any pain. They're gonna be walking for you know, three miles when they could barely make it to the end of their driveway before. So I think that's another patient that I tend to set more realistic expectations. This is the goal of the procedure. This is something that we should probably set for maybe one month, get you to this point, three months, we can work on something more long-term. Um, but just in general, I don't want to, as they see them at their first post-op appointment and they're going to be expecting to, you know, be a marathon runner. Does anyone else have kind of different types of patients they have to set those expectations with? 
something a little different that I have to deal with is not necessarily what's going to happen afterwards. But as soon as you say, you know, we're going to have a procedure that you're put to sleep for, oh, it's surgery. No, I'm not doing back surgery at all. No, I'm not, you know, they, all they think about is like that laminectomy infusion. And so as soon as they heard the words, hear the word surgery, they're like, nope, I'm not doing it. I'm never having back surgery. So then you kind of have to reel it back in and, you know, kind of explain explain again, I suppose, you know, it's a procedure, you are going to be put to sleep for it, or, you know, propofol or whatever your doctors use. And, um, you know, we'll talk about the follow up here too. But the expectations of afterwards are, you know, you're not going to need the back brace, the, a ton of physical therapy, if you don't want to, you know, um, we'll get into that too later. But just the word surgery in itself sometimes just sets them off like, nope, never, never. So I have to kind of explain it a little better for that too. I agree. I always tell them we're not changing structure of your spine. This is really no, like, like Kelsey said, this is no more invasive than an epidural injection and in that you're not getting a hardware. You're not having any bone removed, nothing like that. You're just taking out a little something instead of putting in a little something. And they tend to like calm down when they hear that. And especially if you tell them about how the, you know, anesthesia is similar to like having a colonoscopy. And then they're like, oh yeah, I do that, no problem. So that kind of eases their fears. If you can get them out of that mindset that they think they're having a quote unquote surgery with a tube down their throat and, and very um, invasive thing, then they kind of calm down. It's very rare that we can't get somebody on board with it. I also think that the patient that's like severely deconditioned literally has trouble going just to the mailbox or walking from the bedroom to the bathroom and has to take a break and sit down. Those patients, you have to set clear goals and expectations and let them know, hey, it's going to take a while to get your strength, your stamina, all that endurance back up with probably several months of physical therapy. You may not be walking and dancing around the block a couple of laps. It's going to take time to get you back because they become so deconditioned initially. So it's definitely that patient population as well. I think it's also looking at the severity of their stenosis and kind of guiding your talk track to them. If you have somebody with really, really severe stenosis, you may not get them as far as someone that you could with mild to moderate. So you have to kind of keep that in your mind too, and just know to set that expectation with them that you're going to attempt this first, but then other things, if it's not successful, you may have to, we have to look, look at other modalities. No, is it frozen? We're giving it over to you, Lauren. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, I'm so sorry. I don't know what just happened. Okay, so um, for follow up after the procedure, um, I think the panel kind of has some different um, timelines. For myself personally, um, after the procedure, we see them two weeks out. Um, again, the incision is you know as big as a baby aspirin, and so we use just steri strips on the skin. Um, and so I let them know, you know, those can fall off in time. If they're still there at the two week mark, I'll take them off. Um, and usually the two week mark is really for me to just, you know, check your incision, make sure, make sure things are looking okay. No signs and symptoms of infection. Um, because again, with that, uh, nerve being pinched for so long, the, um, improvement is gradual, most likely. And so I let them know up front too, you know, that two week mark is for me to just check your incision, make sure things are going okay. They might have good relief at that point um, and they might not. So that's kind of talked about beforehand as well. Um, and then after the two week mark, we'll usually see them again at uh, four weeks out. So a total of six weeks. And then that's when I should start to, you know, expect to hear that they're feeling better. Um, we don't go any farther than that. I mean, it's just follow up as needed afterwards. I think some of the others do one week and then one month, three months and so forth. But um, that is what we do at our practice. And then, you know, some protocols for afterwards. Um, 
So we usually tell the patient, you know, for a first couple of days to just kind of take it easy. Um, they go home the same day. So um, they don't need to worry about staying overnight anywhere. Usually ice, Tylenol, ibuprofen are going to be your best friend um, during that first week, you know, just for some post-operative pain, um, which should not be pretty extensive. I mean, like we've said, it's the same kind of as an epidural. And so they might have some incisional pain, some bruising, but other than that, um, they shouldn't have an exacerbation of pain from the, from the procedure itself. Um, recovery wise, again, it's a gradual, um, improvement in pain. That incision should be healed by the two week marker, even the one week mark. Um, when you see those patients, um, no submerging in water until that incision is healed. But, um, other than that, you know, the, the mobility or the activity is tolerated starts pretty quickly afterwards. And, oh, telemedicine. Um, so I would say, you know, for that first incision check, you can have it in an office, but then after that, you know, especially if they're doing well, um, the people who live in rural, rural towns, um, telemedicine comes into play there and it's, it's nice to have. Yes. So we follow a similar, similar follow-up schedule. Um, we usually see them in the office at two weeks. If they do live really far away, and I will do sometimes telemedicine at that first visit, especially if they're super elderly and transportation is a huge issue, because we do have patients sometimes that drive three to four hours to see us, and I hate making them do that just for a quick, you know, wound check, but if they're remotely close, we see them in the office for the first time. Um, and then, you know, I don't limit their activity really much at all. I say kind of do what you can do but you didn't get here overnight, so it's not gonna come back overnight. So you need to have just gradual increases in activity, no matter what that activity may be. Um, and then just tell them, you know, kind of Dr. Deer's analogy is he always gives a three month expectation as far as, you know, you have several issues. We'll see how you're doing at three months. If you're doing pretty good, then, your chance of success long-term is great. But if you're still having some issues, then you may need something else, which is not uncommon because, but this is definitely super minimally invasive. Um, and as others have said, you know, you're not leaving anything behind. So it's literally comparable to the risk of an epidural, you know, very similarly. So I think if the patient knows that, then they do get less anxious about quote unquote surgery. And that's helpful. Awesome. All right. Okay, so my um, part of this section is talking about reconditioning, right? So reconditioning is the time, you know, we sort of emphasize for these patients to, to, to improve. And so, you know, like we've said before, that a lot of these patients or a good chunk of them that come to us are already significantly deconditioned, you know, from their lack of activity, you know, for, for several months or yeah, uh, you know, before even coming to us, or even if they've been sort of longstanding patients of ours, you know, they've they've obviously seen a decline in their their overall activity. So, with with the mild, um, you know, there was a study done at the, the Department of Pain Management at the Cleveland Clinic, you know, where they saw that one year out from from the mild procedure, overall, you know, patients had an increased uh, standing time uh, in walking time. Um, you know, there is sort of what's kind of highlighted here or circled here. Kind of between the month, the, at month three, between the third and sixth month, there's sort of this uh, sort of somewhat steady dec decline or decrease of improvement, and you know, kind of this sort of explains you know a couple couple reasons for that. So anecdotally, patients you know may just sort of you know report again you know lack of improvement that maybe again is attributed to so another pain source, whether maybe it's vertebrogenic or facetogenic, facetogenic. Um, you know, some patients. You know, if you have those that feel significantly improved, maybe a week or two later, you know, or maybe a little overzealous and, and, and kind of push the, you know, push it too, too far too quick. Um, you know, so sometimes they, they, they actually feel worse before they kind of get better. Um, you know, and then again, just making sure it's important to rule out sort of these other sources of pain, you know, that maybe it's not all, you know, stenosis, you know, now that we've hopefully corrected or improved their, their stenotic uh, pain, you know, there, there may be some 
you know, other things, you know, SI joint dysfunction or, or hip joint or, or, you know, facets that maybe need nerve blocks and ablations. Um, so I think it's important, again, as we've sort of said, you know, before earlier in the presentation that, you know, just emphasizing to the patient that this is not an overnight fix, you know, and even if you feel significantly improved, you know, shortly after the, the, the procedure that, you know, it can take several months, it can take, you know, sometimes upwards for some people a year to really fully grasp the, the, the improvement, you know, so, um, and then for those that do feel Im improved or the pain is much less, you know, it's still making sure that they're, they're putting in the work and that they're staying active and, 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 you know, they're, you know, not becoming sedentary or, or, or immobile, even though they're, they're feeling better. Um, you know, we, you know, again, kind of talk, at least in, in my practice, you know, the, what we typically do is have the patients come back a, a week later for the wound check. And then I'll provide them with a script usually for, for very focused, dedicated physical therapy, you know, where, you know, there's some local physical therapy office in our, near our practice that are familiar with this procedure. Uh, my attending, Dr. Lee, who, who I work with, you know, he has done some sort of uh, local seminars and presentations about the procedure. Um, you know, so when we hand the patients the script, you know, usually the PT script is checked off. I usually like to have the therapist focus on, uh, you know, range of motion exercises, postural uh, improvement, gait and balance training, if there's some unsteadiness, you know, or weakness in the legs, um, you know, and just sort of some, some overall strengthening and, and improvement in, in, in ADLs. Uh, you know, we talked about this, that some, sometimes patients, you know, they'll, they'll say, you know, I've done so much physical therapy, you know, maybe several rounds of it before even getting to the, to the mild. So you may experience some pushback as far as even therapy, you know, and, and, and so, you know, I don't necessarily push the issue and, and that's not a man mandatory thing for us. So I'll say to them, you know, if you're going to do PT, you usually do the PT four weeks from the date of your mild procedure, you know, and if they elect not to do the PT, you know, they, I encourage them to do some sort of home exercise regimen, you know, whether it's doing some aerobic exercises, you know, on a, on a seated elliptical or recumbent bike, a stationary bike, walking obviously outside, you know, uh, we even go as far as talking about, you know, the surface that they walk on, you know, concrete is not so forgiving to the spine. So uh, I tell them typically, preferably if they can walk on sort of, you know, asphalt or blacktop or like a track at a local school. Um, and with the warmer months coming up, you know, aquatic therapy is also a great thing. You know, I tell them that, you know, you can even do, you know, walking back and forth in the pool is, is a great way to sort of strengthen your core and lower extremities and, and, and paraspinal muscles that have weakened and atrophied over the years of, you know, being relatively uh, immobile. Um, so there's definitely ways to sort of continue to encourage your patients to remain active and sort of put in the work and, and, and you know, that way long term over, you know, hopefully years to come, they'll have sustainable you know, benefit. And then again, yeah, this is sort of just summarizing, you know, the post-op, you know, usually we tell them, you know, the first sort of week after the procedure, you know, again, you know, sort of be mindful, cautious of what you're doing, but, you know, you, you can also sort of, we want you to increase your activity. We want you to be mobile. We don't want you to be sedentary and bed bound for, for that week. Again, and the pain should be, you know, should be minimal. You know, uh, you know, we sometimes do give a, if necessary, a week's worth of, you know, like a low dose pain medication, you know, just for about five days if they really need it, but then, you know, they come back for their, for their wound check and, you know, we just continue, um, you know, any continued pain meds if, if it's not necessary. Um, I, I kind of touched on this, you know, at home walking programs are, are important, you know, especially I think, you know, if patients sort of, you know, even with therapy, if they feel, you know, it's, it's some people say, you know what, it's, it's a financial thing. I can't pay the copays, you know, so I have a $50 copay every time I, I go to see my therapist, you know, sometimes again, we say, you know what, well, if you don't want to go to, you know, a, a more formal PT program, I mean, there's things you can do sort of, you know, on your own. Um, and then again, follow-up visits, I think, like we said, the panel, we all have different, you know, um, schedules, but we typically do one week uh, and then three months, six months, and then as needed from there on, so. One thing I can say, Patrick, is I've had a lot of pushback with my patients when we try to do PT after mild. And one thing I've said to them that has helped is that, you know, I'll say, you know, now that we've got you feeling better, you can better participate. Maybe you tried PT in the past and failed because you weren't physically ready yet. You were still in too much pain, you know, so now we can get you into a program with a, somebody who's experienced and can teach you the right way to do even your daily things and not do overdo it, do too much too soon. 
and um, teach you a home program so that you can continue with this and then get stronger and just overall have long, you know, longevity with this because I've had people who we get them feeling better and then they just go out and start doing things, you know, that they're not ready for. And then they're coming back in a month or so and saying, oh my gosh, it didn't work. And then when I start talking to them, I come to realize, you know, they started moving and packing and, you know, doing all these crazy things, biking 10 miles or whatever it is that they hadn't done in such a long time. And they really weren't physically ready for it yet. And I yeah. have to kind of rein them in and explain that, that we have to, we have to get you better physically. Yeah. And I think it's like, it's individualized. I mean, everybody's not, you know, everybody's sort of in a different situation. So I try to emphasize that too, that, you know, everybody's recovery will be somewhat different. You know, some people are somewhat fitter, more in shape before doing the miles. They may have a, a somewhat of an easier recovery. But yeah, I mean, I've had patients that they felt great and then they ended up walking three miles, three and a half miles, and then they come back and, you know, I, they said, you know, I'm in pain. I don't understand. I thought I was going to be able to, you know, to walk longer. And I'll say, well, when's, when's the last time you walked three miles or three and a half miles? And it was 15 years ago, you know, 10 yeah. years ago. <laughs> and it's, you know, it's sort of that realistic expectation of, you know, you're you know, you hate to bring age into it, but you know, your, your body's not the same, you know, you know, that was 15 years ago. So you just have to be mindful of, you know, what you can and can't do. And you kind of find that happy medium of, of exercising and, and, and staying in motion. I think also for some of these patients that movement and, and exercise is also a good thing mentally, right? So a lot of these patients have, you know, chronic pain have, have a, you know, co, you know, concurrent, like, you know, depression or some psychiatric or mental, you know, mental health. And I think that, you know, hopefully it's sort of, you know, is helpful physically and mentally. I think we're all in the same boat because our patients are of an age where they're having trouble accepting the season that they're in in their life right now. And they don't like having to limit activity or not do certain things that they could 10, 20, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And it, it really brings them down. So they kind of look to us for hope and getting back to those things. But when maybe real, you know, and again, this goes back to expectation. Maybe those are things that they shouldn't be doing, even if we got them feeling better and trying to, you know, get them to understand that. But to your point about the cost thing with the physical therapy, I have recommended um, for them to, you know, accept the order for the physical therapy and explain to their therapist that it's cost prohibitive and to, you know, sort of fast track it, get the evaluation and then work with them a couple of times and then get the home program maybe sooner just so that they're learning something and not going without anything and, you know, trying to flail around on their own. And that a lot of times will get them to do that when they realize it's not going to be weeks of therapy. It just might be a handful of sessions that they could probably swing that. Yes. I think I'd like to add too for my patients, I have a very hard time getting them to actually go to physical therapy. Um, so I have a lot of brochures and pamphlets in my office that I hand out with exercises that they just do at home. I get a lot more response. Patients are much more willing to do these exercises at home um, mm -hmm. rather than having to drive to a physical therapy office and then drive back multiple times a week. Um, and I think to add to with uh, Patrick's point of it just takes time. Um, I had seen a patient earlier this week um, he's just shy of the three-month mark now, um, but when I saw him at his one-month visit, he was very disappointed. He said, I'm definitely better, but it's only 40%. If this is as good as it gets, I'm going to need something else. And I said, well, you're a month out. Let's give it a little bit of time. I want you to be patient and see how it goes, because if this doesn't work, you're going to need a more invasive procedure. Let's give it the due time that it deserves and see how you do. Um, but I saw him even before the three-month mark, and he went from 40% improvement to 70% improvement. Um, he also had been using a walker, not because he really needs it, but he would just lean over the walker all the time to move around to walk. Um, and he doesn't need that anymore. So now he's 70% improved, not having to use a walker, and he feels great. Um, so really encouraging patients to give it the time that it needs is important. Yes, I agree. And I think even in my area with the PT challenges, I'll even send them one time. And I will tell them just one time for a home exercise program get what they, you know, will give you. And that way you can incorporate this and you're empowering them to take charge in their own care and their own outcomes. Um, so one of the questions or, or comments that we have is, 
someone says they find it very challenging to convince patients that exercise is medicine, as we've all kind of just talked about. And especially in West Virginia, I mean, like my population's not exceptionally healthy. So, um, and, and exercise is not important to a lot of people. Um, so that's a, a different talk track. And I think we all have different approaches. Um, just reiterating like the simple things. I think having their family member there or their friends at whatever visits you can, which I th that's another bonus to me of telemedicine is because they're comfortable in their own environment. They're not aggravated because they're sitting in your waiting room forever. And then they have their family member like in the room listening to you talk to them. And they're like, ah, I'm not any better. But the family member may chime in and say, what you walk out around the block or you're walking the neighborhood and things that they can recognize that the patient may not because all they know is what they feel that day or it's really hard in whatever situation you're in to kind of reflect back on everything. Um, so yes, I think the more we just revisit those improvements. All right, so I'm gonna take it over and we're gonna talk about the next steps for non-responders. But prior to talking about this, I think it's really important that we first define what exactly is a non-responder because I think as we had been speaking about the past hour, um, everyone's different of what the definition of what a non-responder is will differ between what the patient thinks and what we think as providers. So who are those patients where they may think that they're not responding and maybe they actually do? I know we've given a bunch of examples um, it's the patient that maybe we see at the one to two week wound mark, wound check mark, and then again at the four week or six week mark, however your practice does it, and they're like, well, I don't have relief. Again, as Kelsey had mentioned, you have to give it those several months of time, patience, the reconditioning before you're really chalking it up to say, hey, it didn't work. Another patient population, as uh, Patrick had mentioned, is the patient that thinks that they didn't have any improvement and their loved one or their spouse is like, what do you mean? You literally just did a whole thing of dishes um, and you used to have to take breaks and sit down at the kitchen table in between it every couple of minutes. I know in my personal practice, we had this older woman who underwent mild several months ago. She's this old Italian lady and she'd basically be cooking over the, over the stove, like all day making Italian pastas and all these different things. And then she'd have to do the dishes and clean up afterwards. And she would tell me that she literally would only be able to stand for a minute or two to do the dishes or load the dishwasher and then have to sit down in a chair and then get back up and do it again. And she, she had the mild and afterwards she was like, well, it didn't work. And I think we saw her at about one to two weeks after. And her husband's like, well, you literally stood and, and were, was able to, to load the entire dishwasher after the procedure, so it is working. So sometimes the patients think that they haven't responded, but their spouse or their loved ones that reside with them really do. And then lastly, I know we touched on this, but the patients that have multiple pain generators, so maybe they feel that they only got 50% relief, but they have other things going on with their, with their back that they're symptomatic of, so just be mindful of that. So as far as patient satisfaction and long-term outcomes, this is based on the five-year Cleveland Clinic study. So there's an 85% patient satisfaction rate. And I can safely say with my personal practice, I work alongside Dr. Durkin. Um, we've done about 200 cases over the past several years and our results also kind of really mirror that satisfaction. Um, the five-year durability, also amazing results. 88% of mild patients avoided back surgery for at least five years while experiencing significant symptom relief. And to me, this is huge because it's five years. And for some elderly people, that's a long time. This is not a fix where it's a temporary thing and they're getting a couple of weeks of relief, maybe like an epidural, a couple of months. This is showing five-year durability. So this is giving patients the time to get back to living their best lives, doing things that they love to do and enjoying their life more um, than compared to prior to the procedure. And with elderly, that's huge to maintain their independence, as Marie had said, and get back to doing things that they don't wanna admit that they don't wanna, that they're not able to do something. So getting them to maintain their independence is huge. So as far as the patient identification, was the patient properly selected? So 
We know that mild is indicated for all lumbar levels. Some of the interspinous and other devices are not able to be done at L5 S1. So this gives you another option. Um, early to late disease state, degenerative conditions, those that are obviously prevalent in patients age 60 and above. As we get older, things become more degenerated, you know, wear and tear time. Um, the medical and spinal comorbidity is not contraindicated. So patients that either don't want surgery, as we had discussed, big wound, big recovery, long procedure, general anesthesia, they just don't want it. This is a great option for those patients. Or for a patient that may have seen a spine surgeon and was recommended surgery, but they're not able to undergo it, whether that be due to a medical indication, they have a comorbidity perhaps, um, cardiac pulmonary compromise, not allowing them to have general anesthesia and tolerate a long surgery and recovery. So these are excellent mild candidates. And lastly, uh, often not candidates for other therapies. Those are your patients that may have hardware at an adjacent level. You can do the procedure as long as there's intact lamina, um, grade less than two or equal to two spondylolisthesis, and uh, bone integrity or osteoporosis, which some of these things preclude people from having the interspinous spacers and all those new stabilization and fusion devices on the market. So these are all excellent mild candidates. I think. You know, initially we had said in the beginning of this presentation, the, the ESIs may not be working and, and to select these patients for, for mild if they meet the criteria. And that's basically mild's motto. It's the move to, to not be insane or the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So if you have a patient where you're continually doing epidurals, they're not getting relief maybe 50%, maybe none, or maybe it's only helping for a couple of weeks and you keep pushing the epidurals, they're not gonna get a, a different outcome. Um, so these patients with mild, you wanna move to mild right away because this is giving them a durable, better solution for their pain and to improve their functioning. So if mild did not work for your patient, if it didn't work, you obviously didn't burn any bridges, you can move to other therapies. As we had said, you're not gonna have any um, devices, nothing's left behind, there's nothing implanted in the body, so it wouldn't pr preclude them from having potentially other surgical interventions, interspinous spacers, and things like that in the future if they did need it, if they were really considered to not have any relief or effectiveness from this procedure. So some things to consider if the patient did not report improvement. And I know we've touched on these kind of throughout the presentation, but is there any unseen mobility improvement? I was giving that example of the woman who didn't know that she was really doing better because she wasn't taking as many breaks washing dishes. Um, so a lot of the times, the, as you can see in number two, the patient's family or friends or their spouse or someone that lives with them really sees the improvement and the patient doesn't always see it. So we really have to let the patient know, hey, you know, you, you're doing this now and you weren't able to do that before. In my personal practice, when we see the patient prior to the procedure, in my HPI, or you can use the Move Mild questionnaire, we're writing down how many minutes does it take before your symptoms kick in when you're standing, when you're walking, and we get to know the patient and really see what activities are you not able to do now that you wish to do or that you've been limited to do. So that when we follow them, through the different intervals after the procedure, we can compare to prior and really get a gauge on how well they're improving and let them see it because sometimes they don't believe it. Um, number three, we've seen the patient who's pushed too hard now and, and that they're mobile. Um, I know Patrick and Marie were talking about that. People try to do too much too soon, trying to walk or jog three miles when they're not conditioned properly after. So again, making sure that they're modifying and going slow in the recovery process to help improve their strength and stamina. And lastly, how long do you wait before offering other treatment options? And I think that this will obviously differ between practice and physician pre you know, preference. For us, I would say it's at least the three month mark for patients that have strictly LSS and claudication symptoms with only spinal stenosis on their MRI. 
if they have other pain generators and if they're symptomatic of those generators, then we may do some other intervention sooner. But um, that all depends on the patient and really what's the overriding complaint. Um, and another tip that we do is we also measure the ODI or the Oswestry Disability Low Back Index prior to the procedure and at every interval that we see them after. We usually one to two weeks, the six week mark, three month, and then six month mark so that we can also kind of gauge how the patient's improving over time. Because it's not just about the pain scores as we had mentioned, it's about the mobility, it's about improving disability, it's getting them back to doing what they love to do. So some stories, I know we're kind of going back and forth and going over our own personal patient examples. Um, there's been patients who think they're non-responding and really do respond at, at a later time. Um, so what do you guys see? Do you guys see mostly patients saying at that wound check mark, at that one to two week mark, do patients say that they don't have relief? Do they, a lot of them get relief? Does it take a lot of time usually and they don't realize it? What do you guys think? Most of my patients get pretty good relief in that first couple of weeks, but I would say more often than not. But there is a small percentage who don't get it right away, but but yet their partner or whoever lives with them might be saying, well, just like you were saying, well, but you could walk or you could stand or I didn't hear you complaining about pain, you know, things like that. Yeah, so similarly, I'd say for the majority of patients, they do respond fairly early. Um, that's always that's not every patient, of course. Um, if it was, that would be phenomenal, but it doesn't happen with anything. So um, sometimes at the two week mark, at that first incision check, the majority do very well. But oftentimes what I hear are facetogenic complaints and they attribute that to, well, this didn't help me. And that's just kind of the exam and the, the discussion and, and history. And, you know, we will treat facets immediately if that is the issue, if we can elicit that it does seem to be axial back pain. Um, and sometimes that's just every patient explains their issues differently. So that's where Kristen, you pointed out earlier about having the information and establishing that relationship with your patients, at, like setting your expectation so that you are much more open and they're going to be more receptive to thinking, well, I had the surgery and it didn't help yet. Well, that's a totally different issue. So um, that we do, you know, we, in that regard, we will treat that facet, facetogenic issues or whatever pretty soon. But if it's stenotic issues, we do give about three months. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, all right, so that's going to wrap it up for this section. I'm going to hand it back to you, Ashley, to go over the common patient FAQs and some misunderstandings, and I think we'll take some questions from the chat. Thank you. Yeah, so if anybody has any questions, feel free to send those through. Um, and I just always like to give, you know, any kind of pearl that I can offer while anybody's typing, if you so wish to do so. Um, my grandmother's had the mild a few years ago, and no matter what therapy I ever offer to any patient, I always try to talk to them like they're my grandma because she's 90 now. She'll be 91 this year. She looks amazing. Um, she's super healthy, but she doesn't understand anything medical. So she's had an RFA years, like she gets one every couple of years, but she thinks when she comes to see us, and I, I don't see her, but I'm, when she comes to see Dr. Deer or Dr. Kim, that whatever is done should help every single thing that she has. And I'm like, even though we teach that, I always try to break it down in simplistic terms because she's not a medical person. So things are overwhelming to her. And she just assumes, well, the doctor's going to fix me and it should help everything. And if it didn't, then this is what I'm quote unquote stuck with, or this didn't work or whatever it may be. So I just always try to break things down for patients. Um, I use models. I hold them up to myself. I send them home with brochures. I give the most basic analogies for things I can relatable analogy so that they feel more comfortable with whatever procedure or therapy they're proceeding with. 
So one of the questions is, what's your experience with a patient that has foraminal narrowing, narrowing as well? Does anybody have any initial response for that question? Want to chime in on that? So if not, I will take it. So I'll always look for the ligament um, because if in, to my, uh, me, you know, if you have something that's occupying space in general, if depending on what that specific foraminal stenosis, if it, is it a disc, is it like whatever hypertrophy is there, but if you are, have a thick ligament that's causing stenosis in the area and you can unbuckle or remove some of that with a super minimally invasive procedure, I measure all the ligament myself um, and I will definitely offer mild. Um, and I think that's kind of where you, it can be tricky, a slippery slope, so to speak, of like identifying radicular pain with some patients versus claudication symptoms. And that's a huge, that's a huge challenge. And you may see them today and they may have this radicular flare up and it's three, four flare up down their hip to their knee or wherever. And then tomorrow they can't walk because their back and butt is burning and tingling and numb and heavy. But every patient describes it different and all their, you know, let's be clear, most of our patients don't have just one issue. So it does flare and it does change. And you're not always going to know 100% with certainty that that's the culprit, but being transparent, doing as thorough of a workup and evaluation as you can, and telling the patient of their multifactorial issues, I think is the best chance for success, no matter what therapy you offer. And I think that only 5% actually have central canal stenosis solely. So it is going to be something that is multifactorial. So definitely don't exclude those patients. Yes. Another question is how do you respond to patients ask if the procedure itself is painful. So I personally say, you know, you get a little bit of sedation, like you're gonna have a colonoscopy because I feel like colonoscopy is something that everybody can relate to. Um, I feel, you know, I show them it's the size of a baby aspirin. I hold the tip of my pinky up. Say it's kind of a puncture wound really. Um, I personally do put a little monocryl stitch in there under the skin that dissolves. That's just because I'm me and I'm OCD. You don't need that by any means. Um, and steri strips on the outside. So I just reiterate that most patients don't really have much pain at all post-op and I'm not restricting their activity much at all. We tell the patients the same thing and you may have some soreness for the next couple of days after the procedure. Um, we call the patients the day, the morning after just to make sure that everything's okay. And some of them just have that typical post-procedural soreness for a couple of days. And I know we had talked about ice, Tylenol, NSAIDs, and maybe in severe cases, a small prescription of opioids, but it's very minimally invasive compared to a big spine surgery. Absolutely. So I would like, you know, everybody just to give a brief example of how just, how do you, what's your analogy to explain mild to patients? Do you give a plumbing reference? I mean, what, like, how do you say it to people? Just basic, just a quick bullet point explanation. I like to I, use the plumbing reference. I'm sorry, Patrick. No, go ahead, Marie. Okay. Um, that, that makes them laugh and kind of gives a little levity to the situation, but, you know, I'll tell them it's kind of like, you know, clearing out your toilet or your plumbing. And then they kind of, when they get wide-eyed and realize, you know, what I'm talking about. And I said, it's, you know, once it's gone, it's gone. And now things are all ready to move. So that's always a good one. I think we kind of use sort of two things, either you think of it like a drinking straw or a hose, right? You get a kink in the, in the straw or the hose, you get sort of, you know, um, you know, symptoms. So, you know, sort of it's, it's, it's undoing that, you know, that, that kink and sort of straightening out or, or debulking or, you know, to give more, to get better flow essentially. So people seem to, to, to understand that. I think when I use sometimes not specifically just for mild, but just describe stenosis in general, and just the idea of kind of decompressing the space is something that almost everyone can relate to is they've fallen asleep on their arm and their arm goes to sleep. So I tell them you're doing these injections to help with kind of inflammation, but what really needs to happen is you need to open up the space. Just like when you're asleep on your arm, you need to take that pressure off your arm, let the blood flow back. Just like those nerves are being squeezed in your spine, we need to open that up so the, you know, they have plenty of room to kind of function just like they need to. And I think that's an important 
discussion because it's not a problem of inflammation, it's a plumbing problem. So that's why doing tons of epidurals are not gonna be truly effective in treating these types of patients. Yes, I use the um, straw analogy as well with the kink in the straw and then opening that up to help with our symptoms as well. Awesome. Yeah, I use my spine model. It's just a little lumbar spine model that goes down to the sacrum and it has little nerves that kind of hang out truly. And I hold it up to myself and I show them, you know, this is where your ligament and flavum is, whatever the culprit of stenosis is. And if there's multiple contributing factors and it's, it's mobile to an extent. So I literally say when you stand up and it's narrow, you're tightening this space. And then when you lean forward, you're taking the pressure off those nerves and I do the whole motion for them. And they're like, oh yeah, yeah. That's why I can't do anything without the, I can't go to the store without the shopping cart or whatever. Um, so awesome. All right. Well, if anybody does not, nobody has any other questions, then, um, I would like to thank everyone. I'm honored to be here with this awesome faculty and thank you again for your attendance and please feel free to reach out with any questions or, you know, if you need those cards, um, they're super helpful. Um, I love quick reference things. I love bullet points and I love talk tracks. So 